Uh, good morning. Um, I'm very bad at answering my email, so I probably didn't. Uh, uh, these folks were nice enough to make a, a title for me. I'll get in trouble with the idea of publicness versus privacy, because there are those who say that they're not at odds, and they're not in opposition, and they're not at war. It's a continuum. It's like uh, hot and cold or wet and dry. So I want to talk to you about both, though, today, and the relationship to the internet. And what I really want to do is warn you that, that you in marketing could be used to screw up the internet. And I don't want that to happen. So I wrote about publicness because I think that we have this incredible new tool, the internet, the Gutenberg Press in every one of our pockets, that enables everyone to find, form, and act as publics, witness Occupy Wall Street and, and, and the value of that. Um, but to understand publicness and to really grapple with what it means, I had to go through the gauntlet of privacy to kind of understand it, because it does have a relationship, and it certainly has a relationship to this tool of publicness and what's going to happen with regulators. So privacy. One thing I learned about privacy was that the first serious discussion of a legal right to privacy in the United States did not occur until the year 1890. And the reason was the invention of the Kodak camera. The Kodak camera was a new technology, and it freaked people out. It creeped them out that somebody could go and take a picture of you on the street. It could appear in the penny press without your permission. And so a technology caused the first kind of moral panic around privacy that led to this discussion of a legal right to privacy in the United States. Look at the parallel to today, and one can go overboard finding parallels uh, that, that, that you know, argue one's point. But we see a technology that changes our behavior before we have a chance to catch up our norms and our, our understanding, mutual understandings of how we operate together. And that causes fear. The change causes fear. And then we don't know what to do about that. So what do we do? We try to clamp down this technology. We try to, try to put it in a bottle again and, and, and worry about it. And Lord knows that's what's happening with the internet. And it's happening under many guises. There are many attempts to regulate the internet now under the guises of piracy and privacy and security and decency and all these things. But I fear all of that. We're going to come back to that in a second. But privacy alone, of course, is important. We all do need our privacy. I think there's a concomitant ethic to privacy, which is an ethic of pu publicness, which is an ethic about sharing the information you do have in your head. And when you tell someone something, why you do that, and what good could come from that. When I shared the stories of my prostate cancer in my blog, I got incredible benefit. I got support from friends, people I didn't even know had had the operation. I got information that I wouldn't have otherwise gotten. I got the opportunity to inspire men to go get tested. And no matter what the government says, go get tested. More information is always better than less information. Um, so I found benefit in doing that. Now, no one should have ever forced me out of my prostate closet. If I didn't want to tell the world about it, I'm not saying anyone should be, be forced to do that. But those who choose to do so bring benefits. We'll talk more about those benefits in a minute. So privacy and publicness, I think, are a continuum and do depend upon each other and are uh, related to each other. But again, in the internet, we're finding this discussion about uh, privacy as a danger, and it's a danger that you, marketers, are bringing upon us. Um, so we find ourselves faced with regulation, and this worries me greatly for the internet. And you know what? It's our own fucking fault. Because we in marketing and media, I'll put myself in the media end of that, were not nearly transparent enough about what we were doing, why we were doing it, and what benefit could come to the public for doing it. We enabled the cookie to be demonized because we were not transparent enough. And I'm afraid it's too damn late to pull back. I'm afraid this demonization, moral panic, is so far down the track that we're going to find our dear internet regulated in ways that will be very harmful to it because of this. The regulation comes from a good heart and a good cause and well-meaning people. But the regulation, I fear, will change the essence of the net. And that's what I'm, I'm warning about. There are many unintended consequences to this regulation. 
few examples. One is COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which sounds like a perfectly wonderful thing to have to prevent companies from basically using any information about someone under 13 to oversimplify. You all have dealt with this, I'm sure. But there are many unintended consequences, the first of which is that we've taught our children to lie about their age. You're not supposed to lie about your age until you hit 40 or 50. Um, and Dana Boyd, uh, I was on a call with the, the, um, the Future of Privacy Forum, or I'm a, 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 supposedly on the advisory board, a call with an FTC attorney about COPPA as they're about to extend COPPA and make it bigger and better. And I asked whether there had been any research done on making children lie about their age, or how many lied about their age. No, none. Well, so it happened that Dana Boyd, the brilliant Dana Boyd from NYU and Microsoft, a few weeks later came out with research where she found that in her sample, a majority of children age 12, under the 13 cutoff, had Facebook pages. <gasps> but what was really great about what Dana revealed was that three quarters of those pages were created with the help of their parents. So here we have regulation supposedly meant to protect children at, at the will of parents, and there was no research about its effect. I asked the FTC whether there had been any research about how often parents availed themselves of this notice requirement. None. But most importantly, I asked whether there had been any research about the chill that was put upon creating sites for children. None. Now, I know when I, one of the first sites I started on the internet back in the days to learn how it worked was a site called the Yuckiest Site on the Internet about uh, boogers and cockroaches. Uh, because kids like that stuff, right? And it, was, it went, went very well, we sold it to Discover Magazine, and my bosses at the time said, don't do it again, because COPPA had come out, and the liability was too great. The greatest unintended consequence of COPPA, I believe, is that children are the worst served sector of society online. That's the unintended consequence of trying to regulate this technology out of fear. Now, in Europe, Vivian Redding, uh, the, the justice minister there, basically, yeah, I think that's her title, at the East, vice president of the EC, has, as you probably know, come out with a very um, long and detailed set of proposed regulations on privacy there. And I have read through them and studied them all quite a bit. I'm trying to get the, ner the, the nerve to write a long, long, long blog post about it that will bore the world. She has a few pillars that, again, sound very good, that are brought on because people are fearing what we do in marketing and media, but that have great danger. One, for example, is privacy by default. Sounds wonderful. But if privacy were the default by law, we would never have Twitter. We would never have Flickr, which are public by default. Another is the right to be forgotten. Again, sounds really good, but it becomes imminently complicated immediately. If I have an interaction with you, if I share information with you, if I have a transaction with you, then whose data is that, mine or yours? That's the kind of fight we're going to end up with here. Uh, the idea that I own my data sounds wonderful, but it's not as simple as that. Nonetheless, in this regulation, there are requirements there that you may collect data, only the minimum necessary for the task you announce, and, and you keep it only the, shor the shortest time possible to perform that task. Well, that means a lot of the ideas of analyzing data, getting an idea of histories, finding anomalous relationships, all these wonderful things you're probably talking about could be outlawed. Or you could find yourself in a horrible liability position. Well, you say, okay, I'm not in Europe. We're in New York, hey. But one of the other pillars of this regulation is that Europeans' data must be held worldwide under the standards of the EU. And that sounds wonderful once more. We like the EU. They have good coffee. But if we grant that right over the internet to the EU, then why aren't we also going to grant it to China and Iran? I fear this regulation that we have coming. Now, in the US, President Obama just released the proposed Bill of Rights of Privacy, I think, two weeks ago. I've read through that as well. It's a more reasoned document. And the beauty of it is that it is trying to go for some measure of self-regulation. And as you know how that works is that if you, if you create a code and you agree to that code, the FTC's enforcement uh, rights will come in to say you violated basically your promise. So there's some measure of self-regulation there. But 
that's pretty broad about the FTC. And you know, they've even gone after Etch-a-Sketch. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, I wrote a post right before Christmas suggesting that they were going to go after Santa Claus for keeping, uh, uh, tracking children and keeping data as to naughtiness and niceness, uh, including their names and addresses. Uh, so I fear this regulation that we have coming. And I, and, and I think that what happens is that if we don't open up real fast, then it's going to come. So my plea to you is to become radically transparent about what you do, why you do it, how people benefit, and to give them the access to their own data. Yes, it is, to some extent, their own data. And there's a great model for this, which is Amazon, of course. When I go to Amazon, I bought a book from my wife about playing the piano. It kept on giving me damn piano books. Or worse, when I buy a present for my daughter for Taylor Swift, you should see what it gives me. Um, and of course, Amazon tells me why it's doing this, shows me the benefit of it, and lets me get rid of it. Why aren't we all doing that in marketing? Why aren't we all figuring out what the value is? I spoke with the, the team in Munich a few months ago in uh, uh, handled privacy for Google. And they came under a huge wave of protest, as you know, about Street View. Um, the, well, a German official there created a, a fuss trying to urge people to ask for their homes to be blurred in Street View, leading some wag friends of mine on Twitter to call their nation Blurmany. Uh, it actually has a word. The Germans, of course, love to make up words. And there's a fair pixel unsrecht, a right to be pixelated. And 440,000, I think, Germans uh, took up that right. Uh, and Street View came out. And it came out without a lot of problems. But Germany has stopped doing it there because it's too much of a pain. So who lost out and who won out there? Um, that's the problem of where we're headed. I, I, like all of you, I'm sure I'm, I'm in love with Kickstarter, and I bought stuff on Kickstarter, and I think it's, Kickstarter is great. I'm fascinated with the idea that you can build a company with zero risk, knowing exactly what's going to happen, and that you can use your customer's capital. And that changes the relationship. Best Buy. Best Buy's had a few kerfuffles lately, but they've done pretty amazing things. They have uh, the 12th Force Twitter handle. I recently had a problem. Uh, I need to find a product. And I've now learned if you go to 12th Force, horrible name, but a marketer invented it, um, Twitter Help Force contraction. There are 3,000 blue shirts at Best Buy who are on that account. And you will get an answer to your question like that. It may not be the right answer the first time, but, but I could go back in and have a conversation with all these experts who knew all the equipment, and I got what I needed. It's pretty amazing. Some companies fear enabling 3,000 employees to talk to the public. Best Buy realized that they already were anyway. Best Buy also opened up its API so that you can start your own store. Think publicly. In my own business, journalism, I teach entrepreneurial journalism at CUNY, I think we've got to redefine what we are as a business. I think that we, we, we still believe we're in the content business. That is the presumed logic. And I'm not so sure that's true. I had lunch some time ago with an executive, former executive of a network news operation. And he said, you know, Jarvis, he didn't sound like that really, but I'm going to make him sound like that. Uh, you know, Jarvis, he said, Google and Facebook, they're using our steel, media's steel, to make their cars. And they're extracting the most value, and we're not. And he said, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't value content. And I thought about that. And I said back, no, I think you're wrong. I think Mark Zuckerberg values far more content than you do. We in the content business only value the content we make because we think content is defined as that which we make. Mark Zuckerberg and Google see content everywhere, and they've found the way to find value in it. Now, our content still has value, but its value is as a signal generator. It, when, when you read this content, it tells Facebook what you're interested in, what you care about. That's where the value is, is in the relationship and the data about it that enables Facebook to better serve you with content services and targeted advertising. So there's incredible value there, but Facebook truly understands it's in a relationship business. We in media don't. I think we've got to change in that way. So let me end off with two things, then I'll come down and play Oprah, and you can yell at me, and we can argue and have the most fun. Um, 
there are many benefits to publicness. There are many benefits to this great tool that we have, the Internet. And again, I fear that if we are not diligent about our role in it, we could fuck it up. We won't be the ones doing it. Regulators will be. Legislators will be. The privacy regulatory industrial complex will, will make a huge industry out of this. But it'll be blamed on us. It'll be because we creeped people out. And that's a problem. So I think we have to recognize the benefits of publicness, and there are many. It creates trust. It enables people to find each other. It enables relationships to form and be improved. It enables people to disarm stigmas. Considering, consider how gays and lesbians in this country used publicness, those who chose to stand out of the closet, those who used the courage to do that, to beat back the bigots who'd forced them in there. Publicness has many benefits. Publicness is also, I think, just at its very, very beginning. This internet thing of ours is new. We have a presumption today that the change we're undergoing is happening at a lightning pace. We hear that all the time, how the change is so fast. I recently thought, maybe not. Maybe the change is actually occurring very, very slowly. And so we're only at the beginning of it. Privacy is a very good excuse to regulate the net. And it's going to be successful in one way or the other. Unless we stand up in a few ways. One, I would argue that you as marketers need to stand up and become radically transparent about what you do, why you do it, what benefits there are. Two, I think we have to also recognize the value of this internet thing we have and to have a discussion about principles to protect it and the public society that it enables. Now, there are many efforts at these things. Uh, I never want to see a constitutional convention for the internet. I never want to see a structure out of the United Nations for the internet. I want to see the internet be uh, the uncontrollable beast that it, that it should be. But I do think we need a discussion of principles. One is that we have a right to connect. When Mubarak shuts off your internet, can we agree that that is a violation of human rights? I think so. That right is a new preamble to our First Amendment that is a right to speak. And that is a necessary condition to the right to act and assemble. I think we have to look, as I said, at privacy as an as a ethic of knowing someone's information, publicness as an ethic of sharing information. I think we have to protect the public good, what is public, when Germany pressures Google and not taking pictures of public views from public streets, it has diminished what is public. I think our institutions information, institutions, not our own, institutions information, including companies, should become public by default and secret by necessity. I think that we have to recognize that every bit is created equal and when any one bit on the internet cannot travel to the other end of the internet, if it is detoured or stopped along the way, then no bit can be presumed to be free. And finally, the Internet's architecture must remain open and distributed. No one should claim sovereignty over the Internet or it's not the Internet anymore. So that's what I wanted to say. And I think that it's important to recognize that as you go about your work, you have a huge impact on this most powerful tool in our history. So I'm begging us all not to blow it. Thank you.